Hello everybody, my name is Anna Katharina Brinkschulte and I'm your host today for the track of Film Academy's project, the pretty cool project of Annie Film and Annie Play. So I guess Annie Film, Annie Play is the most intense time during your studies because the students have to come up with great ideas in just four months. They have to not come up with an idea, but besides that, create an IP, an intellectual property. They have to develop a unique world and to derive two formats from that. So one format is the linear one, so it's the film. The other format is the interactive one, the non-linear format, a play. So this could be everything from a mobile game to an art installation or even a stage play. But besides this highly creative process, we also ask the students to come up with their own workflows, their pipelines and their tools. So they have to manage two projects doing really producing parallel. And as if that is not enough, of course the focus is on teamwork because they didn't know each other before. It's the first time the students of the third year come together. The students of all subject areas, as of animation, technical directing, and of interactive media. So they don't barely know each other. And to say it short, it's a mission to fail. And that's OK, because failing is the first attempt in learning. We are surprised every year anew because they come up with awesome projects and awesome work. And no matter how hard we make it for them, even a pandemic can't stop them when forced working in home office to do great projects. So I'm very proud to present you the projects of any film, any play of the last two years. And the first one is going to be Face Your Dear, a project about social anxiety. Hello. My name is Saskia Stirn. I am the producer of Face Your Dear, and this is my lovely team. When we started the project in the fall of 2019, we were very soon certain that we would like to create an IP that is centered around the depiction of emotions that are being reflected in the outside world. Um, we threw around a couple of ideas for a period of time and went in different directions. And uh, we found out that we all shared experiences with social awkwardness. And we decided that we wanted to express them in our project, as well as maybe encourage viewers who may struggle with social awkwardness themselves. So the central question of the project became, what happens inside ourselves when we feel like we are being judged? We explored a variety of ways to express social awkwardness from the exaggeration of physical features to the expression through monster-like creatures. But we struggled to put together a storyboard that was clear enough and at the same time artistically satisfying. Eventually, Franzi, our super talented animator, designed this adorable little guy who became our main character. The design is deliberately simple and it is genderless so that everybody can identify with the protagonist. Um, he has round shapes, is very wiggly and bendy in his movements. We compared him to a stretched nerve. We thought that we could show the character's nervousness best if we put him next to another character that looks and acts completely opposite. Taller, with sharp edges, more detail and minimal movement. And so the deer, or in this case, the stag, entered the picture. The stag functions as the antagonist in our IP. He represents the judgmental stares that the protagonist feels like he is receiving each time that he finds himself in an awkward situation in public. The stag has a tall and proud build with broad shoulders. He has very large antlers. He stands upright, is dressed in a turtleneck sweater, and oftentimes he carries a tiny espresso cup that he takes sips out of while he's looking down at our protagonist 
with dis disapproving glares. Although we seem integrated into the world like a normal character, he is actually not real, but a ghost-like figure that um, stems from the protagonist's imagination. And he gets projected onto other characters each time that the protagonist's fear of being embarrassed in public is getting triggered. For the trailer, we decided to go for 2D animation. Our talented animator Franzi, who has already designed the characters, animated the entire film by herself uh, using TV paint. Our art director team, Hazel and Paul, worked together with Bessie, the director, to develop a collage-like style. We used photograph textures, combined them with conventional digital coloring, and mixed in some halftones and dust overlays to achieve a very gritty, haptic look. The compositing was done in Adobe After Effects. Because we used mixed media to color in Franzi's animation, we took multiple photographs of certain textures, creating stop-motion sequences for objects like coins that our protagonist drops on the floor or a curtain that is being drawn. For the music, we were lucky enough to work together with the super talented Hannes Britz, who is a film music student at the Film Academy. He created a beautiful original score that is just as overdramatized as our protagonist's perception, and he used instruments that are reminiscent of old hunting sceneries, which is tying back to the deer motive. The score is complemented by a rich and menacing sound design that was created by the equally talented Film Academy alumni uh, Sirius Kessel. In the trailer, the protagonist finds himself in a series of situations where he feels like he embarrasses himself in public, uh, although the situations themselves might not be as harsh as he may feel that they are. Each time the stag suddenly appears in the frame, shooting judgmental glances down at the protagonist, unsettling him even further. The fear and nervousness is building up in the little protagonist until he finds himself in a final situation that urges him to choose. Will he finally bring up the courage to face his deer? We will now show you a little snippet from our film. Unfortunately, we cannot yet show the entire trailer, but please enjoy. For the AnyPlay, we had the goal to put the user in a situation where they would experience the social awkwardness that our protagonist feels, as well as give them the opportunity to face their deer and overcome it. So we knew early on that we wanted to make it an installation or a live experience. First drafts included the idea to have two users interact with each other in an awkward setting, but ultimately we decided to have the user face our stack antagonist instead. We came up with the idea of having the user speak or sing into a microphone on stage. It is a motive that is also being used in the trailer and we felt that having to use the own voice in public can be very awkward at first, but at the same time very empowering and rewarding. Here is a sketch of our final construction. It is a room that the user enters through a red carpet. The outer walls are covered with black molotin and the floor is covered with wooden tiles resembling a theater stage. In the middle of the room there is a rostrum with a microphone that is being lit by a spotlight from above. In the back of the rostrum there is a beamer that is projecting the audience, consisting entirely of copies of the stack, onto the back wall. As soon as a user enters the room, they are being registered by a Kinect in the back of the room and the stacks turn their attention towards them. The only way to escape their disapproving stares is to talk or sing into the microphone. Our technical director Justus wrote a code in Unity that triggers certain stages in the deer depending on factors like pitch, 
volume and duration of an audio signal. As the user is speaking into the microphone, one by one of the stacks turn into copies of the cute protagonist, a process that is being pictured by a progress bar that is rising up the stacks. As soon as all the stacks have transformed, the user gets a well-deserved applause by the audience and the experience is over. We presented the installation last year at a school presentation and received a very emotional, overwhelming positive reaction by those who experienced it. We put together a little experience trailer that we would like to show you. Thank you so much for listening and please enjoy. I can't do this. What if I embarrass myself? I have to go out there. Just stop thinking. Okay. Just be yourself. But they are all going to stare at me. I can't do this. I have to go out there now. Just go. Just be yourself. Act normal. And go out there. My legs are shaking. I'm going to embarrass myself. I need to go out there now. Okay, let's just do it. Let's do this. Imagine the universe is a not really decisive child. How would life be like and how would the world look like? For answers, I hand over to the team of Eni Mini World. Hello everyone, welcome to the FMX presentation of Eni Mini World. My name is Paulina Larsen, I was the producer on this project and I'll be taking you through the presentation today with Bianca Scali, who is the directress of the trailer and Clara Deitmar was the directress of the play. So I hope you enjoy. So before I'll get into explaining the IP and how we built the world around it, I'll show you a little snippet of our trailer for you to get a first impression of our story. Hmm? She laughs me, laughs me not, 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 laughs me, laughs me not. So I hope you enjoyed that little first snippet. Um, as you might have seen, we have this little universe who has to make decisions for humans on Earth. So we like playing with the idea of indecisiveness because we all kind of could relate to the topic. Um, and we thought, but what if humans weren't even capable of making their own decisions, but um, it was the universe's responsibility? So our central question was, what if the universe couldn't decide? So um, when we were thinking about how we want to characterize the universe, we thought it would be cool if it would be a child, because um, when you're younger and being confronted with your first responsibilities, it can be very overwhelming. So um, of course, our universe is still curious, fun, and playful, 
but um, because it's kind of new to the job of making all these decisions for the humans on Earth, um, it is easily overwhelmed. So the relationship between the universe and the humans is that the universe kind of sees um, the humans as its little pets or as a child would maybe play with its toys. So um, the decisions that are being made by the universe for the humans isn't necessarily um, being made on a very responsible level or not always on a responsible level, but also on a more childlike um, and playful level. Um, but still, uh, the universe really feels this new responsibility and new pressure, and so the stakes um, get higher for it. Um, a way we wanted to visualize uh, the pressure and um, this feeling stuck um, in making decisions was with loops. So uh, we have um, our loops on a visual and audiovisual level. Um, and our moral of the story is kind of that when there's no decision, there's no progression. So um, I'll show you a little, another little snippet where you can kind of see all these loops building up. <laughs> you Bless me not great so now I'll get into the style um, so in the previous two snippets I showed you you might have already seen that everything is very simple colorful and also childlike um, and we we like the idea of having this very flat world because also children at a young age when they start drawing they don't really have the sense of perspective yet so everything they draw is kind of flat so um, we had that as one of our more stricter um, design rules good so that was everything from my side so far and now i'll hand it over to bianca and thanks for listening so far Hi, I'm Bianca Scali. I'm the directress of the trailer part of Inimini Mini World. So I'll tell you a little bit more about the film. First, I'll tell you about the story so that we're all on the same page. So in our story, the universe will get emotionally attached to two humans. And because of this emotional attachment, he won't be able to make a decision. And once he can't make one decision, then he can't make any other. So all the indecided situations will become loops and add up to each other. And this will create a lot of stress. And all this stress will build up until the universe finally makes one decision. What was important to us, even before we decided of the story, was that we had to decide of the perspective or the window from which we would show our IP in the trailer. And this became the perspective of the universe. So this meant that we had to identify more to the universe than to the humans. And it impacted a lot the style. Also, we had to make a difference between the world and the universe, so we decided to add a frame. The world, the backgrounds, the humans would be in a frame, but the universe wouldn't be, because he's the frame. And then we decided of a em main emotion, and that was stress. Now more about the style. Like Paulina said, we wanted a world that was very playful and to show the perspective of a child. So we imagined that children maybe see the world just like they draw them. So we broke the perspective in all the possible ways. This means that we don't only bro break the perspective of the backgrounds, but we also break it in the humans themselves. The whole film is animated in 2D and in Blender. We decided to use Blender because we needed to reuse a lot of shots and didn't want to redraw them, so it had to be vector-based. And now about the emotional curve. We wanted to tell an escalation of stress. And our main elements for that were sound. So every situation had a specific sound. And all these sounds would add up and create a rhythm. 
or a little song that was playful. Then visually, we wanted to repeat everything. So every situation that we saw again and again and again would be shown from the exact same perspective, just zoomed in. And visual, the visuals and the sound would have to be sped up through time so that the stress is increased. Um, now I'll let Clara talk about her window in the play. Hi, I'm Clara. I study interactive media and I was the directors of the play. I'll quickly show you our experience trailer. Uh, uh. I could use some help. There's so much to do. wanted to create a playful, interactive experience that captures our world and lets you play beside the universe. On an interactive table, a cityscape opens up to you and 15 little interactive stories start to play. The universe is already overwhelmed, but you are there to help with all of the decisions. We really wanted to capture the childish playfulness and showcase the style of our world through a hidden picture book kind of game where you would be able to feel overwhelmed by all of the little things going on but at the same time experience playfulness and help the universe out. To show our sprawling city we decided on an interactive screen that could be multi-touch and multi-directional so that up to six players could sit around the table and play together. The screen is set into the table, containing all of the hardware and speakers. We also wanted to really lean into the child aspect of the universe, and uh, we set the interactive table really low to the ground, creating a sense of childish play. We kept the style pretty similar to the trailer to tie it all together, but to be able to finish all of the animations in time, which were 15 scenes or with multiple endings. Our lovely animator Sarah Bear created the animations in 3D. Each loop that is created by the stories has a particular sound to it and when they overlap they create a rhythmic soundscape similar to the trailer. By setting four speakers into the corners of the table we also created a kind of locality to the sounds in the city. Another speaker is placed above the table, and through it the universe speaks to us, asking for help, calling to action, and responding to things we do. And we had a lot of extra wonderful little sound snippets from our child voice actor who plays the universe. And since playfulness was really important to us, we used them as little easter eggs all around the cityscape. This really supports the feeling of a hidden picture book game, and so it's not only about the stories that play out, about the decisions that have to be made, but also about tapping all over the board to find further interactions with the universe. And uh, thank you to our wonderful team um, who worked on the trailer and the play, and it was great fun working with you. That wraps it up. That was our presentation, and thank you for listening. So, next in the row. New rules, old forest. Title says it all. So therefore, I hand over to the wonderful project and the wonderful presentation of the next team. Uh, hi, everyone. We are Team Woods People, and we worked on the IP Old Rules, New Forest. Um, our central question 
is what happens when a bunch of magical forest guardians get trapped in a runestone for hundreds of years. So um, in order to get into that, I first have to talk about what we mean by forest guardians. Um, basically, you know, like, for example, like a sphinx who um, says, you, uh, before you, you um, continue walking this path, you have to answer a riddle, like something like that, basically. Um, like a, a monster of any kind who blocks your path and doesn't let you go any further without doing something for it. That could be anything like asking a question or also giving them your firstborn. And because in this world um, that we created, these creatures are real, uh, humans have particular feelings about this because of course, like no one really likes giving their firstborn in order to go somewhere. And so after um, a lot, of, like a lot of suffering um, from humankind, they decided to banish these creatures um, from this world, and doing so by putting them inside uh, like a, a rune stone and um, like sealing it with magic. Um, so after this happened, um, humans were finally free from this burden, and they continued to live their life like as a civilization, like our world, basically, like, you know, things develop, like technology happened, people got cars and whatever. And so a lot of stuff um, just developed like, like it did in our world. And one day suddenly these guardians come back because the rune stone um, that was like working for a very long time suddenly broke. And this means that these creatures come back and they are suddenly confronted with like not like just a few travelers, but instead they are confronted with modern technology, with cars, with highways and everything. So here we have the second picture of the Sphinx who is sitting on a highway and trying really hard not to get a burnout from all this work. And yeah, this was basically our central picture uh, for, uh, for this production. We just wanted to, to tell the story of um, these out of place magical beings who are now confronted with a world that is no longer operating on their rules, hence the name. And yeah, so um, we then went on as soon as we had this settled um, on thinking about how we want the film and the game to intersect with each other. So, um, because we didn't want them to just basically be the same thing, just one is playable. And so we decided on having like the film um, explain like the origin and like the banishment of these creatures. And then at the end um, show like the result when they are confronted with the modern world. And in between is the game where the rune stone is working and intact and these creatures are banished, but the rune stone has to be maintained in order to stay intact. And the player character, so you, are the one who has to maintain it. And so we have like a switch of perspective here. So we have two sides of the same coin and hence two protagonists who uh, operate on very different principles. So in the film, we have um, the salesman, um, his name is never mentioned, but just so you know, um, he's the narrator and he's like this Mephisto-like creature who likes to, you know, like collect babies and souls and whatever uh, from humans. And he's like just just a plain evil guy, but like kind of likable. And um, and in the game we have a nameless human, and you play him, and you have to um, like get to the rune stone and clean it, so um, humankind is once again safe from this threat. And um, yeah, so you have these two. And um, like another important part of the IP is um, that we try to have like, you know, like these protagonists and the setting, but also have it um, work together with a lot of mundane stuff. So um, like, as you see in this picture, which is one of the first I drew, um, they just sit together and talk about their problems. And like this is actually in a final film and we just wanted to make sure that this world feels real and tangible and that just, you know, like have the, the, um, the general gist of like just a real and um, just likable world. 
And yeah, and apart from that, uh, we had to cut a lot of content because of, you know, Corona and everything. So there's still a lot that is unpublished and that we could tell about the, um, the characters that were sadly not introduced um, like fully. We mentioned them briefly in the film, but there's two characters that have a lot going on for them, but sadly, um, because um, we couldn't make it into the final film, um, they don't get the spotlight, but we will see what we can do with them. So yeah, um, without further ado, we can watch the, the movie now and talk about the game. And thank you for uh, listening and for your attention. And yeah, bye. Back in the old days. In order to travel through the woods, you had to face three trials. One of strength. One of knowledge and wit. Before you pass, you must solve my riddle. And last but not least, a test of determination. A sacrifice! But a long, long time ago, our kind was banished from the mortal world. Mankind somehow found a way to lock us up. As long as this stone was intact, we would not be able to escape. But oh, the irony. Whoever touches the soil of this path shall pay a price. Didn't go so well, did it? <sighs> so, uh, this was the film. Now uh, we will watch the game trailer and afterwards I will talk a little bit about it. So uh, have fun and we'll see us in a minute. All right, as you could see, um, we did a mobile game and the goal there is to get through the old forest and to clean the old rune stone from the movie where the monsters are trapped in. And also the connection to the IP is that you get this lost feeling uh, the characters have in the movie. And of course, there's a twist in the game. Uh, your phone battery influences the light amount that the character in the game has. So with every battery level, you have another experience in the game. Uh, there are also a few things which help you to reach the goal, which reach you to get through the runestone. Uh, for example, the light the, or the lamp of the character gets more blue, the more or the closer you are to the runestone. And also the battery level decides at the beginning of the game um, which hint you get. Uh, so there are a few hints uh, what you can do to reach the goal. And technically, there are two things which make sure that the player gets lost. 
The first thing is um, that we created a random generated forest. So uh, every time you open the app, it's a complete different forest and you can't just walk the same path you did last time. And the second thing is that there's a fake 3D thing going on, even if it's a 2D game. And this is because we want to make sure that the player loses the feeling for left, right, and up and down. So uh, with we um, aligned the camera to the, the player direction, and then we also aligned everything else around it to the uh, camera axis. And then it looks like a 3D thing, even it's 2D. So uh, this was uh, a brief overview of the game and our project. Thanks for your attention and enjoy the FMX. Scientists came up with the idea that dinosaurs actually had feathers. So how cool is that? Fluffy dinos. So I have a pleasure to introduce Julius Dorsel, the producer of the next project. Hi, my name is Julius Dorsel, and I'm the producer of the project Fluffy Dinos, a any film and any play project of the third year in the winter semester of 2020 at the Film Academy. First, I'm going to talk about a bit the about the IP and the ideation phase. So the basic idea comes from that scientists found out that dinosaurs actually had feathers, and we wanted to take this idea and push it to the limits and say that dinosaurs suddenly become feathers. So this is the like proof of concept image that we came up with. Um, we didn't just want them to be the laughing stock of our movie or our game. We wanted to celebrate the diversity that they had, and we wanted to look at how they adapt to their new form of featheriness and sudden change. So in the story concepting, it based on that no one really knows what dinosaurs actually look like. Um, we wanted to have that IP to, IP to dismantle those stereotypes, and we had a lot of different ideas and settled on one idea, which was the idea of a T-Rex lurking in the bushes, stalking his prey, and then suddenly turning feathery, which turned to the issue that he wasn't that scary anymore. So it starts off with two parasaurial offices, just chatting it up, being stalked by a T-Rex in the background, them getting very scared when they notice him because imminent doom is, upon, doom is upon them, and then being a lot less scared once he suddenly turns into this beautiful majestic creature that doesn't look that threatening, threatening at all. Next is the character and look development that we went through. Um, the concept for the dinos and fluffy dinos was obviously very fun, but it was also really challenging. It began with researching dinosaurs, just also online, and we all knew what dinosaurs looked like, right? But we never really had to research them in that sense. We went to the museum, um, looked at some exhi exhibits where they also had dinosaurs with feathers on them, and did some sketches, took photos, and used that as some inspiration. We found some stuff online too, but we found a lot of realistic references. So we wanted something more fantastical. We researched dinosaurs, um, closest rev living relatives, which are birds. And we found a bunch of birds that look really, really funny and interesting and colorful and, and more, yeah, fantastical than what a typical dinosaur looked like. So we started sculpting some stuff, adding textures and adding some details. And the idea was to increase some proportions, but not make them completely fantastical. So the goal was to have them not realistic, but fantastical, and they were supposed to be something that you could imagine meeting in real life. The proportions are, if you compare them to the real thing, very different, but we wanted to accentuate that some certain areas and make them more individual and exaggerated. This, of course, applies to the Parasaurolophus, but it also applies to the T-Rex, which got more bigger jaws, bigger thighs, a bigger belly and more funny looking eyes. And then we cover them with some feathers, especially in the back to not cover them completely, but make it a bit more um, funny and fun to look at. And this is how then the final T-Rex looked in the final shot. Next are the feathers. So the feathers played a key role in our IP and movie, obviously. So we started really early with looking for possible solutions and testing if we were able to create these feathers in 3D space. This is the first test you can look at. We tried different plugins and scripts for Maya and Houdini, but none were really sufficient enough for what we needed. So we decided to go with Houdini and the Feather tool by Tyg Rezenkowski, which I might have butchered, and build upon those. 
However, for the creation of the feathered geometry, we used the built-in tools and were able to quickly create and iterate on different shapes. For the placement of the feathers, we created our own tool since we weren't able to achieve what we wanted with the built-in tools. Our custom tool uses curves as guides and deforms and scales the feathers then accordingly. With the normals of the character mesh, we calculated the orientation of the individual feathers. Furthermore, the tool created different masks and attributes that later would be used in the shading of the feather, which was completely procedural and without any textures. The shape and look of the T-Rex plumage was inspired by the royal flycatcher bird. We used Houdini's hair tools to place and groom the curves that would later be used as placement guides of the feathers. After finishing the grooming, we simulated those guides with a vellum solver and sent them right to our placement tool. One problem with our tool was that it didn't resolve intersections between feathers. We planned to solve this issue at some point in our tool, but then at the end, the time ran out. However, by increasing the thickness of the hair guide in the simulation, we got rid of some intersections, and now you can see what the final product looked like. Lastly, for the movie part, I'm going to talk about the environment development. So the environment of Fluffy Dinos went through a challenging visual look dev, um, especially scaling felt really hard because of the oversized layout flora and the dinos also being very big. So it was hard to get that idea across how big they actually are since a parasaurial office in real life is two meters high. We started with a sketch and went over to a style frame that we built in Photoshop out of visual moves that we had before. Then we rebuilt that reference with Quixel Mega Scans assets and layouted the environment procedurally in Houdini. Our main scene featured a jungle clearing that would then act as a stage for our story. Um, there was a big, a high bush in the background where the T Rex is hiding behind and sneaking up to its prey. This is the development over time, and you can see the clear change between the final render and then that in composition, which came in later with adding fog and depth of field and some more polish. A uh, big challenge was also that our environment artist actually started learning Houdini with this project and it was his first full CG film. Uh, so he had to get in the software really quickly and learn all the ins and outs, which if you know Houdini is not a simple task that quickly. Now onto the game. First of all, the base mechanic of the game. It is a platformer, an endless runner, and an auto runner, meaning that the game can go on forever. The only goal is to get a maximum high score and beat your own high score or that of your friends. The idea was to make it work on mobile, so we iterated a lot, added different gameplay options, played around with ideas, added different input options, but at the end we actually reworked a lot of the core gameplay just a few weeks before the game uh, had to be finished. So the game works like this, that you run around a level, you collect feathers, and the more feathers you get, the more points you get, but also when you hit certain thresholds you become more feathery in the sense, in the visual sense, all the way to the top fluffiness, we call it. And depending on which stage you're at, you don't jump as high, so the more feathers you have, the lower you jump. And if you have more feathers, you also glide slower, meaning it's a bit harder to calculate where you're going to land and it's a bit harder to reach those platforms. The levels are, are all full of hazards, so geysers that you know, launch you up, um, bushes that steal feathers from you, enemy dinosaurs that could kill you, lava that burns you up, and eventually there are some hazards that can kill you, which is then the game over state, and the goal being to collect as many feathers as possible to get that high score. At the very end, we actually change from a gradual curve to discrete changes in with the feathers. So at the beginning, with each feather you collected, you the there would be a change on how high you jump and how slow you fall. Um, but then we rather, also because of the multiplier system, we switch to making that discrete. So there are different stages at the beginning, you jump very high and then as you see in the second picture, you have some feathers, and then on the last picture, you have a lot of feathers and made them extra colorful to make it even more incentivizing to collect all the feathers. Now to the art style, which you can already see a bit here. Um, we needed something that was easy to create because we have a very we had very limited time um, for the asset creation. It had to be different than the film because we couldn't do realism in the amount of time we've had, uh, also with the amount of experience we've had so far with games. Um, so readability was really important, but we also wanted the look to work in general. So we came up with this paper cut um, style. So we added the textures in Photoshop, just drew a kind of like a cutout style. And it was supposed to be this handcrafted world that has like this childlike feel is fun and imaginative and playful and something where you could say, hey, yeah, I could kind of like build this myself technically. Um, so that's how we put it together in Photoshop on the first like look dev kind of thing to see how it would work out. 
and a big issue was finding a good color scheme. So we tried out a lot of different stuff. We added gradients, we added a lot of different colors, but we also noticed that it was like going in the wrong direction. So we got some outside help. We got some help from Jiro, our artist, our art lead, and we came up with some newer colors and iterated a lot of that and then finally settled on this. And we couldn't really find a good workflow for that. We just at the end had to iterate a lot. Another big part that we're really proud of in the game are the forgiveness mechanics. So forgiveness mechanics are mechanics that kind of make the game feel better for the player. Um, it was supposed to feel really satisfying. The issue is that perfect code doesn't lead to a good experience because if you only are allowed to jump at the very specific like millisecond time interval where you can jump, it feels, well, clunky and not really responsive. Um, so we added in some mechanics that would alleviate that problem. Um, two big mentions being the Wily Coyote jump. So if you go off a platform, you still have some time buffer to where you can actually do the jump and jump off that platform, which makes it a lot more easy to navigate and not as punishing. And also a cache for the jump. So if you hit the jump, so touching the screen or hitting a jump button on a computer um, before you actually touch the ground, so you're not actually able to jump now, the jump is cached. And as soon as you hit the ground and make contact, the player jumps up. So it feels a lot more responsive. You don't really notice that it doesn't feel like you're pressing too early and then you jump. So we had to fine tune those values a lot. But at the end, we came up with, uh, with some numbers that really felt really good and made the game satisfying to play still feel really snappy and kind of just made the game feel the way we wanted it to feel. Lastly, I'm going to go into the level generation. It's pretty simple level generation. Um, since we're using Unity, we just created these level blocks that have a trigger in the middle. And when you hit that, hit that trigger as a player, it generates a new level block. We used a boilerplate level block or prefab so we could always ensure that the height of the platforms and the height of the ground were always correct so we didn't have to do any like calculations with that we would just say that the designers had to make build them in a way that would fit into that um, boilerplate at the beginning we had each level block just be instantiated with unity which if you know how unity works might know that that's not a good idea because that is a big problem with performance especially on mobile so we had to get rid of that and at the end actually had all level blocks that we would use at the beginning inside the scene when the scene started they were all deactivated and then once you hit the trigger one of those level blocks that is inside that scene is just moved to the next position which we calculated by the size of the of the platform quick overview of the team we have harold dietrichs being the film director erica esmeram being the play director lucas cap was the technical director and did all the feathers Jiro Magracia was the art lead. Matthias Schaudek uh, was our environment designer. Danilo Sedano did programming. And then there's me. I did some additional programming and was the producer of the project. Thank you very much. And thanks for listening. Last but not least, I'd like to welcome the team of Fish or Chips, a project truly shaped by the realities of the moment. So what has happened to poor seagulls if the humans suddenly disappear, no fries. Welcome to the world of Fisher Chips. We are Nina Wölbecher, Julia Scala, Adrian Steuer, Niklas Wolf, Paul Golter, Justus Henne, and Vanessa Schneider. And we are telling you the story of chips addicted seagulls in lockdown. When the humans disappear and the seagulls are unable to survive without chips, it inevitably leads to an existential crisis. In our film and game, the seagulls have to support each other and work together to get through these hard times. The home of our main characters is Deep Frightened Beach, a fictional place full of shattered seagull dreams, memories of a blissful past, but also full of hope. So our protagonist for the film part is Sully, and especially Chips Addicted Seagull. So as there are no more chips available due to lockdown, he suffers from sincere chips withdrawal symptoms. His little sister Maud tries to feed him fish and he kind of starts to get into this fishing lifestyle until eventually the chip shop reopens and he falls back into his old chips addictive patterns. We decided to use an Instagram blog as the format for this project because this way we could really bridge the gaps between the um, clips we were producing um, in a way where we could actually follow the characters over the course of a few weeks. And we really like this as our um, way of premiering this project right now because 
there are no cinemas open, so this is, this felt like, this is the way that people are connected right now over social media, so this is the way that we wanted to connect you guys to our characters. For the art direction, Nicholas and I um, cooperated and we wanted to find a look that was 2D-ish um, and rather graphic way of thinking in 3D. Um, and we were really inspired by the film Feast and by pop art and um, as a way to kind of um, bring in the touristy mood. For the visual development, we just jumped right into style frames. Um, and I, like there were made very many assets that I had to develop that would be used in both the film and the game. And this is how slowly but surely Deep Frightened Beach would take shape. For the character designs, it was important that to find um, designs that were also as graphic and highly stylized. So these were the final characters as they ended up looking. It's Sully, his little sister Maud, who's the secret hero of everything, and the other seagulls. Um, yeah. And after doing the, the turnaround of these turnarounds of these little guys, they were ready to go to production. And Niklas will now tell you more about the character creation process. From the concept stage, we went into character creation. Julia and I sculpted the characters based on her concepts and I did the retopology and UVs. After that, we textured the characters using Substance Painter. We tried to create an organic, hand-painted look by intentionally creating imperfections and keeping some visible brush strokes. For the environment, we shared a lot of assets between the Instagram and the game part of the project. This was a smart decision, since we had to create a lot of assets in a short amount of time. Our asset pipeline was to model and unwrap in Blender, Texture and Substance Painter, and shade the assets in Blender and Unity. We used the open source rigging framework MGear. MGear creates a guide that you have to adjust and extend with additional controllers to fit your character. The user can change the guide easily and fast to other characters with the same overall structure. The face setup is pretty simple. We mainly use blend shapes for the eyebrows and the beak area. For the eyes, we created the setup using MGIS Facial Rigger. Because of the short amount of time we only had, we decided on a simple setup for the wing. If the wing is unfolded, the wing works like a standard arm rig with IK and FK. If the seagull folds its wing, the geometry gets changed to a perfectly folded version. Our animation style is inspired by how seagulls move in reality. The head movements are pretty stiff and fast, but on the other hand, seagulls are fluid and elegant when they are flying, so that's the reason why we decided to animate in step mode and have a more rough approach. To achieve the snappy timing, we created smear frames if necessary. For shading of not only the characters, but also all the assets in the environment, I created a set of shader node groups that could be stacked depending on which of the shading features like reflections, we needed for a given object. We were then also able to fine-tune the look of the non-photorealistic shading using a wide range of parameters, like the grunge amount of the shading edges, the position of these edges, or even blending in a bit of smooth shading. Furthermore, these node groups included custom AOV outputs, which allowed us to reconstruct our NPR look in compositing, just like you would with a typical PBR workflow. For the lighting of the Instagram stories, we had defined the desired mood in our key visuals. And I used these as a guide while lighting the shots. To be able to light all the posts in a short amount of time, I created a set of six different lighting templates for different moods. That included not only a sun, a fill and a rim light, but also the sky matte paintings by Alexia and the matching dome light. We could then just import these setups into our lighting scenes and adapt them quickly to reach the desired look. In compositing, we pushed the style even further by not only adding lens effects and tweaking colors, but also by painting out certain shadows or adding additional rim lights in some of the posts. Because in this project the active production time was only around two months, we needed a fast and reliable way to manage our pipeline. This was done by Pool Tools, a set of tools to manage a 3D production which I am developing for quite a while now. 
And one part of it is the Pull Tools Hub. With YAML files, we can easily add software starters to our project to ensure that each artist uses the exact same configuration and plugins. It also supports multiple project environments. Another part is the Project Manager. It helps you to have a structured way of working, avoid errors and save time. With integrations for Blender, Nuke, Houdini and Maya, the Project Manager is mainly used to quickly navigate your project structure to open files and save them with automatic naming convention and versioning. It also manages asset publishing with lots of different options and types and, of course, to quickly import them. What also helped a lot was the Asset Updater, which scans your scene for linked assets and lets you easily update them. Being a seagull during a pandemic is hard. The humans are gone and so are all the chips. We asked ourselves, how can we create the ultimate seagull experience? We came up with a 3D co-op game where the players are on a frantic hunt for food. The two players have to feed their baby seagulls with fish and chips before the time runs out. Fish are hard to catch and fries are hard to find. And the baby seagulls are lining up, trying to be fed. Let's watch the trailer to see what the game feels like. The game was developed with the help of the Unity game engine and since we were working in a considerably large team, it was necessary to allow each team member to work on the project concurrently and establish an asset pipeline that automated publishing and distribution of our new work. This pipeline was taken care of by Paul's pull tools, allowing me to concentrate more on the central game systems and art. On this front, we focused on an engaging, non-photoreal art style, supplemented by cartoony visual effects. At the end, we were looking at several dozens of assets, many of them interactable in some way. Our animator Vanessa was able to capture a clear emotion and readability with our character animations, while most environment animations and effects are handled procedurally, minimizing our animation effort. Tech-wise, it was crucial to implement a solid architecture early on that can be reused in different game scenarios, as we started out prototyping different game ideas. Additionally, since our team was rather new to game development, I needed to make sure to put systems and tools into place that were very usable for non-techie game designers learning the Unity game engine. For this, documentation is key. I have to give the users of our tools a solid platform that they can rely upon for reference and learning. Eventually, we settled on a 3D jump and run style game. This came with the challenge of implementing a character controller that feels familiar to everyone who has played a jump and run before. Getting the game feel right here is paramount. Additionally, we wanted NPC characters to have complex behavior, running away from players, navigating towards certain objectives, and so on. Together with all other systems in place, audio, input, camera, UI and interaction systems, just to name a few, we ended up with a code base of almost 10,000 lines and a complex structure of many intertwining systems.
This has been the only full money play project of the past two years. So thank you very much for the lovely insights you gave us and the great presentations. And thank you for listening. Take care. <laughs>